fresh strawberry and rhubarb. Um, there's a little tiny just hint of vanilla ice cream in there. Um, we do do some barrel fermentation and that's where that comes from. So really spend some time smelling it. And then the third step is tasting it. So I'm gonna do it sort of exaggerated because in the wine business, we, we, we taste this way, it's kind of goofy. Hopefully I won't choke, um, but we go like this. I spit because that's how we do it professionally. I'm not gonna spit anymore after this, but I just wanted to show you that. And then taste the wine and feel its broad, broad attack over the whole palate. This wine is very, very savory. And it makes you salivate, which is, a, uh, which is a winemaking technique I'll get into in just a little bit of how we get that savory, savory flavor. But it's very fruity, a good almost tart, sweet tart acidity to it. Um, it's very dry finish. A nice little uh, dryness in the front of the mouth uh, and um, uh, just a really great, long, persistent, persistent finish. And so that's the fourth part is then this overall evaluation of the wine. Do you like it? Do you not like it? What kind of food do you think it would go with? Do you think you should drink it now or should I, should I age it or should I, is it too cold or not cold enough? Blah, 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 blah. So that's tasting wine. So now let's talk about the wine we just tasted. This is uh, Marjoram Riviera Rosé. And just as I was explaining about Santa Barbara being such a uh, remarkable city because it faces directly south, so does the French Riviera in the south of France. And uh, the Santa Barbara is oftentimes referred to as the American Riviera because of the because of how much how similar it is to the south of France, with the south facing the mountains coming up directly behind the uh, behind the town and obviously the same Mediterranean climate and the Mediterranean cuisine that we have here too. A lot of seafood, a lot of fresh vegetables, a lot of alfresco dining, a lot of grilling. Uh, so we uh, thought it was really appropriate to call this Riviera Rosé and we trademarked it because we're geniuses. Um, and uh, it's, been a, uh, it's been a huge, uh, huge success for us. It's actually the wine that we make the most of and it's our problem. So then it's our theoretically our most popular wine. It's made primarily from the Grenache grape, uh, but we use a little bit of Cunoise and we use a little bit of Syrah in here as well. We take the red grapes, we bring them in the winery and we press them immediately and we essentially make white wine. Red wine only turns red when it has interaction between the skins and the seeds of the, of the grape because the pulp inside is white, red grape or white grape. So this is a red grape, we bring it in, we press it, we make essentially white wine in stainless steel tank and then right before we bottle it, we add a little tiny bit of red wine to get this really perfect color. And the red wine we add is a little bit of Grenache, which is that orange color, and a little bit of Syrah, which is a very, very, very pink, pink color. So we put in about, it's about uh, one quarter of a percent of, of, uh, of Syrah and one half a percent of Grenache to get this, get this nice color. But even that little tiny three quarters of a percent of red wine add structure to the to the wine and that's why some of that dryness in the front of the mouth comes from from the tannin so it's not only a, a what we call a pool rosé a rosé you just drink by the pool side because it's it's a uh, low alcohol and it's delicious and you don't even need food with it but it could segue easily into having food with it uh you could have it with uh, i love it with smoked salmon i love it with crudite just raw vegetables uh it's great with um uh smoked fish, any, any uh, uh, smoked trout and, and things like that. It's, a, it's dry, it's, it's got good acidity, so it goes with a lot of, a lot, a lot of foods. Um, what else did I wanna tell you about this? Uh, oh, low alcohol, which I think is very important. And um, uh, we get, we, that's because of the cool climate. So we actually get Grenache to ripen enough that we can make rosé out of it uh, the, 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 without being at a, at a higher alcohol. My wife has a, a, a fabulous uh, t-shirt that says hashtag rosé all day because at 11% alcohol, you can theoretically drink it all day. And uh, my, my son points out that because uh, he's, he's, even though he's 23, he still knew that hashtag used to mean pound. And so he always goes, that's a perfect shirt, pound rosé all day. <laughs> so I hope that was funny. I can't tell because I can't hear any of you, um, but uh, I think uh, now, uh, if we're ready to have Sherry come back and see if you have any questions about this wine, I can answer them. 
Excellent. How's my sound? Are we feeling a little bit better now? Way better. Okay, wonderful. So Mona asks, is it a little bit effervescent? Are you feeling yes, that with it? Yes, thank you. That's a great question. I told Sherry, I said, the questions are going to help me. There is, so I use, I don't use sulf, a lot of sulfur in the wine. The wine is made in a very natural way. And the way to naturally preserve the wine without using an antioxidant like sulfur is to leave the lees, which is the natural sediment as a byproduct of fermentation, they're antioxidants. So we leave the lees in the wine right before, until right before we bottle it. But we also leave quite a bit of CO2 in the wine. And I'll show you, don't, you have to do this with your bottle, but look at, <laughs> look at how much CO2 is in that wine. It's below most people's threshold. Uh, a lot of times people will see it if the wine is just, just changed temperature, either from, gone from cold to warm, or from warm to cold, it'll, it'll show effervescence. But for the most part, it's below most people's threshold. But it means I don't have to add very much sulfur to the wine. It also means if you drink a glass and you put it back in the fridge and you come the next day and you open it, you'll hear a little, you hear that I didn't even have to fake do it because it actually did it. It, it goes because there's CO2 coming off the wine. And that third, that second glass you have out of the bottle that you, you put in the fridge for a day is just as good as the first glass because all that's coming out of the wine is CO2 and it's, so it doesn't oxidize. So this is great preservation without using sulfur. I'm actually allergic to sulfur. I get sinus infections if I get a hit of sulfur. So I don't, I use it, but very, very, very sparingly, about a quarter of what most wineries use uh, uh, in, their, in their wine. Sulfur use in the, in, the, in the world wine industry is just way overused and it's a prophylactic. It's easy to make wines not oxidized uh, by putting sulfur in them, uh, but it's way better just to make uh, sound wines and not letting them oxidize in a more natural way. And so that's what I do. Great question, thank you. Doug, we have another question from Melody. She wanted to know, um, is that sold in cans too? Is that something she saw on the website? These are great questions. I'm not a good marketer. Um, <laughs> This wine comes in three liters, magnums, 750 milliliter bottles, half bottles and half bottles in cans. And the cans are great because you can take them camping, you can take them to the beach. Uh, they're, they're, it's a very good, uh, it's very good uh, way to store the wine. We put rosé in clear glass because um, you wanna see the color. But as you know, most wines don't come in clear glass because you know, uh, ultraviolet light oxidizes wine. And so you know, we, the cans don't let any ultraviolet light where this clear glass uh, does. And so, um, uh, yeah, cans are great. They're, they're 375 milliliter cans. And they're the cutest can in the, in the world. If you get a chance to go on the website and see them, they're just, they're darling. Excellent. And I, our last note before we move on, um, Leslie wanted to let you know she's finding this fascinating and kind of funny. So your jokes are hitting home. <laughs> good. You, you, know, you, you can't tell, you know. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> good. All right. So that's the rosé. Thank you. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed it. It's dry, light, low alcohol, crisp, you know, just drink up and, and, uh, and buy more. Mm. Okay. So the next wine is called M5 White. And we call this M5 White because my last name is Marjoram and it is a blend of five different grapes. Uh, this is all from our state vineyard in Los Olivos. And um, the five grapes are, and there won't be a test. I know this is a college event, but we are not gonna test you. The five grapes that make the M5 White are Grenache Blanc, Marsan, Roussan, Viognier, and Picpoul Blanc. And I was a consultant for a winery in the south of France, and I was mainly a consultant on the red wine program, uh, but they brought myself in and another consultant named Philippe Gambi uh, to come in and help them decide what white wine grapes that they wanted to plant in their vineyard. And so we did, you know, three days of tasting and blending and looking at different grape varieties and all that work uh, ultimately paid off for them but it really paid off for me because shortly thereafter, uh, we acquired a property and were able to decide what uh, grapes we wanted to use on our, on our new 18 acre uh, vineyard property. And so uh, I love Grenache Blanc uh, and I've made Grenache Blanc in the past, but Grenache Blanc is a little monochromatic. It's, it's just that it has one flavor. And through, through working with Philippe Gambi, uh, we, just, we really thought that we could we could make better wines in France and subsequently better wines in, in America, blending these 
these grapes that have that have traditionally been blended together before, uh, but in a in a sort of a more unique uh, 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 using Grenache Blanc as the base is, is a more unique concept. So this wine is primarily Grenache Blanc, and then it's it has Marsan and and, and uh, excuse me, Rousson and Viognier in it, which are both very aromatic, very rich, unctuous grapes, very thick skinned. They make very heady, almost oily uh, wines. And then we add the two lean and means, the Marsan and the Picpoul Blanc. Picpoul literally translates to lip smacker. Uh, it's one of the highest acid grapes that exist in, in the grape world. And we, we, this wine, uh, the 19 has about 10% uh, Picpoul Blanc in it, which really helps to stop the, the sort of unctuous grapes from being too unctuous and really gives it that nice, dry, crisp finish. So you smell the wine, it's all about tropical fruits. It's been barrel fermented. So it's got that nice creamy, lazy, uh, uh, almost, almost cheesy smell to it. Uh, it's got, um, uh, mango and and a uh, little bit of pineapple uh, aromatics in it um, and and some wood aromas because we do we do age it in in, in mostly neutral barrel but there's some some wood flavors in it and it goes through the, there's two two fermentations in the in the wine business there's the primary fermentation which converts the sugars in the grape into alcohol and co2 and we keep all the co2 in the in the wine like in the like we did with the rose uh, oh that is the cutest little dog um, and then, uh, uh, and then we, uh, completely lost my train of thought because that cute dog came on the screen. That's just going to kill me. Uh, and then the secondary fermentation is a bacterial fermentation, which you, you can choose to do or not do. Uh, we allow it to happen in the M5 white because it creates another set of complexities and another set of acidities. So it takes the malic acid in the, in the white wine and converts it to lactic acid. You know malic acid because you eat green pip and apples, and that is the classic malic acid taste. Those are there's tons of tons of malic acid in green pip and apples, and then there's lactic acid, and you know those because you you have milk and you know butter, and those are milk acids, and they add a creaminess and a, and a vanilla and a richness to the wine. So there's some malolactic fermentation in there, and there's also a lot of retained CO2, just like uh, with the rosé, but not as much because. When the wine's in barrel, it breathes a lot more, where this, the rosé is made in stainless steel tanks, which don't breathe, but the barrels breathe so that it loses some of its CO2 that the rosé has, but there's still quite a bit of CO2 in the wine. So it's those five grapes, all fermented separately, and then blended like a mixing board, starting out with Grenache Blanc, then adding those other two very aromatic and very rich grapes, the Viognier and the Roussan, and then, then bringing it up and balancing it out with the Marsan and the, uh, the Picpoul Blanc. Um, I think it's a terrific wine. It's probably the most accoladed wine that we've ever uh, made. It got the it was in the top 100 of all wines by the wine enthusiasts. They taste something like 30,000 wines a year, and they pick 100 to be their top 100. And, and the Marjoram M5 White was number 32 uh, in this year's top 100, which is um, for a little winery like us is 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 really really huge. Um, I hope you like it. I think, uh, are there any questions about this wine, Sherry? Yeah, we did. Um, so Carly and Michael were asking a little bit about the discovery process. So how do you determine how much time that you leave the skin on the grapes? And that was, that was just a question we had on the rosé. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So I interestingly, most people make rosé by crushing the red grapes and letting there be skin contact. Uh, and then pressing it to get and, and then to get the pink color. We, we don't do any skin contact at all. We, we, we crush the grapes and press it immediately. And essentially there's no color, it's white. Um, the, the problem with the skin contact is, is if you, you know, it depends on the vintage, it depends on the, the temperature of the grapes they come in, you can get a very dark rosé wine and we don't want dark rosé wine. Uh, so we we don't we we take no chances. We bring it in, crush it, press it, and then we color it at bottling by adding red wine back in. Uh, so no skin contact on the white grapes. We do do a limited amount of skin contact, but almost all white grapes have no skin contact either. But we like when we are getting certain varietals in, like Picpoul especially, which is very pithy. We do some skin contact for white grapes, but you're talking hours, like a couple hours or three hours. 
Oh, that is a cute baby too. You guys got to stop doing this. Toy <laughs> Maya. That's little, little munchkin. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, but for red wine, the way you make red wine, obviously, is you do skin contact because there's no color unless you do skin contact. So we're going to, we're going to taste the red wine next. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we taste the red wine. But good the question part. comes in, does the skin contact make the rosé stronger? Um, it does. It adds more tannin because the, the skins have the tannin and it also uh, uh, adds color, but it's very, very hard to control. I mean, you, 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 you just, it's, I feel it's better just to press the grapes and then, and then, and then move on. Uh, now there is another, going back to rosé because I left a little segment out of that. We take some grapes in, we crush them and press them. That's the majority of the rosé, about 85% of it. But the other 15% of it is a technique called signe. Signe means to bleed. And so when we get the Grenache in, we crush it like we're gonna make red wine. We siphon off some of the juice from the, from the fermenter. And that's slightly, slightly pink because it has had some skin contact and we ferment that separately. It makes the resulting, Grenache is an extremely low pigmented grape. And so if you're making a red Grenache and you siphon off some of the juice, the juice to skin ratio increases, so you get a better Grenache, and the extra credit is you get a little bit of rosé. But it, it's very heady rosé. It's very alcoholic because all the sugar is what you're siphoning off, and it's it's much it's it has that skin contact. So, but so 15% of this is skin contacted Grenache and Syrah that we've signed, and uh, signe is a, a great word to say. It's hard to spell. S A I G in accent. E, E. Okay, more questions? Yes. Um, so Jill was wondering, um, how far in advance should she be opening up the bottle of rosé? How far in advance for the, the M5, the white, and the Syrah? So your, your suggestion on um, prep time before drinking. Well, rosé, just open up and drink it. I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't much matter. Uh, it's it's pretty, pretty much what it is is what it is. Uh, the, the M5 white, I, I find the, the wine, uh, when you initially open it up, uh, it's, it's, we, we, we tend to make wines in sort of a reductive manner, which is uh, we, we, don't, we leave them on the lees and leave them in the barrel. They get very, in a very antioxidative state, once again, trying not to use sulfur. And so when we put them in the bottle, uh, they, they're, they're, a little, they're a little devoid of oxygen. So I, hopefully you've noticed, even with the M5 white, as when you first poured it in the glass to where it is even just these few minutes later, it's really opened up. It's become more floral. It's really gotten a lot more aromatics as it's gotten more oxygen in it. And that's the other reason for the swirling is to really let that wine open it up and, and get it. Now, for the red wine, which we're going to next, uh, I still think you should open it up and start drinking it and tasting it. But this particular Syrah, I, had a, I was at my tasting room today and we had a buyer from a, a, a chain of, of high-end grocery stores in the tasting room today. And I opened a bottle for him and he tasted, he goes, oh, it's, you know, it's good. And I said, but hey, wait, let me go get a bottle that's been open for a few days. And so I went back and, and, and got a bottle that had been open for a few days and poured him for that. And he goes, oh my God, this wine is great. So when we're getting to the red wines and I'll explain that when we get to the red wine, maybe a little bit more in depth, they are also made in a reductive uh, winemaking style, very antioxidative style. And we've put it in a bottle and then we've shoved a cork in there, uh, which really, really locks it up. And so you'll see, and if you feel like it and you have a cool place to keep the wine overnight, drink a glass or two of the Syrah or just a little bit of it and put it away till tomorrow and see how it tastes. And then taste it again in two days and you'll really see how it opens up. That also emulates about how long it'll age too. So, you know, a day is about five years. Uh, and so really, you can really show, show people, you can show, I can show you how long the wine's gonna age and improve and get better because that leaving it open sort of emulates what it's gonna do if it's stored properly uh, in a cool place, in a dark place at the right temperature. So now speaking of temperatures, um, suggestions to serve these, these wines at, what, what temperatures do you suggest? Okay, so I'm, I make all these wines at 55 degrees. Uh, I drink almost all my wines at 55 degrees, red and white. Uh, now that's a little crazy. The white should be drunk about 45 degrees and the reds maybe at 65 degrees. But uh, I like starting out reds cooler because they'll always warm up. 
Uh, but, you, you know, most the biggest mistake most restaurants make is you go order a glass of wine in a restaurant and the open bottle wines on the bar. It's probably 75 degrees there in that bar and that restaurant. And they're serving you a glass of red wine at 75 degrees. That's, like, oh, that's horrible. And, and uh, so no, no warmer than 65 degrees for any red wine. When, when they were talking about serving wines at room temperature, that was castles in south of France where it was cold and uh, room temperature was much colder than the 72 to 75 degree temperature we're keeping our kitchens and, and living spaces at. So never feel bad to put uh, a red wine in the fridge for five to 10 minutes before serving it if you ha don't have it stored in a cool place. But I store all my wines at 55 degrees and I drink them at 55 degrees. But more, the rosé actually tastes better at 45 degrees and the, uh, the red wine will, will open up and become more effusive and more aromatic at more closer to 65 degrees. I know that's not a good answer, but for the most part, all of you drink your red wines too cold and your white wines too warm. I can, I can say that with confidence. And my wines, especially my red wines, taste much better if they're served cool. Okay, wonderful. You talk a little bit about storage. Um, the best way to store these, what was your suggestion on that? So the biggest killers for wine getting ruined are light, which we talked a little bit about, ultraviolet lights. You don't wanna have them in the sun or any place where they can get light to them. Uh, temperature change is more uh, uh, debilitating to wine than temperature. So if you have a nice cool place that say 65 all the time, that's a good place to store wine. The, 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 the perfect cellar temperature is 53 degrees. I keep mine at 55 degrees because I don't want to, I like them to age a little bit quicker. Um, so dark, cool, uh, UV free and vibration free uh, because vibration will, will make the wines oxidize and age quicker than you want them to age. So, uh, you know, get one of those little wine coolers from uh, Home Depot or, or probably not Home Depot, but uh, a good local uh, store that sells wine coolers. And, um, and it just, you know, keep your wine in there. And it, it keeps it at the perfect temperature and high humidity, obviously. Uh, if you, most, most of the wine coolers keep it at a, at a humidity level because you don't want the cork to dry out. Um, and then well, actually, caps, you can score, you can store standing up, but you can store them on their side as well. But all corked wines need to be stored uh, on their side so the cork stays moist. That leads us to uh, our next question. Um, how do you choose a twist top for the white and rosé as far as a cork versus a twist top? Well, um, the, the, the rosé is a great wine to just lock up. And so we have a, we have a screw cap that just, just knocks it locks it in and we want to keep all that CO2 and all that freshness and brightness in there. We also, uh, people, consumers love screw caps because they're, you can go to open your refrigerator and you're into that wine in seconds versus having to find a corkscrew. There's also a small percentage of wines that are under cork that are, that are flawed because the cork has a, might have a slight taint in it. And, you know, nothing makes me more worried than someone having one of my wines in a restaurant that has, as the term is called corked that they taste the wine and they go, oh yeah, I don't like marjoram wine. Well, it turns out that was the half a percent of my wine that are ruined because there's a bad cork in them. And that's about the percentage that it runs. And it's just, it's just the, so going to screw cap means you don't have any corked wines. Um, now the cork, the, the cap that's in the uh, uh, rosé is different than the cap that's in the M5 white. Rosé, we want to lock it down and not have it breathe and just don't, don't, don't go changing. But the M5 white, since it's barrel aged and barrel made and made in a reductive way, if we locked that wine down, since there's no oxygen in it, it would actually spoil. It needs to breathe. And so we have a, a very fine micro pore pad in the, in the, in the top, of that, uh, uh, top of that capsule that allows the wine to breathe like, it's, like, uh, like it has a two inch cork in it. Uh, it's, it's a relatively new technology to the screw cap business, but uh, we, we never used to put this wine into screw cap, but, but with the new uh, micro pore breathable screw caps, uh, we, we've started putting M5 white into a screw cap as well. Also, we sell a lot of wine to restaurants and restaurants love screw caps because they can unscrew it, pour the glass out, screw it, put it back in the fridge. It doesn't leak, doesn't get little cork stuff in it. So um, that's, that's the reason, but it's a great question. So I've already pulled the cork out of the Syrah. 
And I'm going to take a little bit of my glass and I'm going to do what's called priming the glass. And a lot of times if you're switching from a very aromatic white to a red, I just take this and I, I dump it out because now I have a new sort of fresh glass called priming the glass. And now I'm going to pour in the Syrah, uh, 2018 Marjoram Santa Barbara County Syrah and uh, give it a nice swirl. I opened this about an hour ago, um, but you know, the, the cork being out of it with that little tiny uh, quarter size cylinder touching air is nothing like what we're doing here is really allowing to, to get lots of air. And you can decant it too, if you feel like you it's a little closed in, doesn't hurt to just splash it into a decanter and then splash it right back in the bottle and, and, and go that way. But if you are at home or you're somewhere where you're drinking the wine at 75 degrees right now, go get an ice cube, plop an ice cube in the wine and swirl it around for about three seconds. Take the ice cube out and it'll taste a lot, lot better. I guarantee you that little tiny bit of water that's gotten in there is gonna make no difference at all, but the temperature change will make a huge difference. So I can't see all of you, but uh, those of you who are drinking that at 75 degrees, get up, get an ice cube, put it in the wine, swirl it, fetch the ice cube out, throw it away, and just if the wine, the wine will be way, way better. So again, all the wines uh, uh, are grown, all the grapes are grown organically. Uh, we, 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 the estate vineyard is 100% organic. Uh, we are sustainable. We really are big, big believers in, in being good stewards of our land. We plant cover crops to encourage uh, native uh, 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 bugs and insects to thrive. We have owl boxes that eat the gophers. Uh, we are really, really working hard to not, uh, not add much to the ground. We don't use any fungicides. We don't use any pesticides. Um, we, we're, we're completely organic and we're also vegan, which is weird to say because, but a lot of wineries do use uh, animal products to find their wine. And uh, the only wine we actually find is the rosé, uh, but we find it using pea shoot powder. So all the wines are, are vegan as well. So let's taste the red. I, I cheated and saw a chat room question. So, uh, cause it popped up. So I, sorry, Sherry, I, I jumped ahead. Um, so this is the Syrah. Syrah is a tremendous grape. This is mostly from the estate. Um, it's not only Syrah, but it has a little bit of Viognier in there. And if, now that I've told you that, hopefully you'll see that in the nose. There's a slight white flower smell to the nose as well as the oh, almost black pepper, almost licorice smell that this wine has. I love Syrah. I think it's a quintessential uh, California wine. See, mine's too cold now. I have to do this because it came out of my cellar at 55 degrees and it's, that is a little bit too cold. Um, but yeah, it has cola and, and a, almost like a black, black raspberry and a burnt raspberry pie uh, smell to it. We press, the, we bring the Syrah grapes in, we crush them, we put them in one ton open top boxes and we punch down to, during the fermentation. The fermentation creates so much CO2 that all the solids are lifted up to the top of the fermentation tank. So we take a stainless steel tool and punch it back down to the bottom. It immediately rise up again, but we do that three times a day. And that's how we get this very, very fine extraction uh, from, the, from the grapes. Most wineries take a pump and they pump the, the juice back on top of the wine and, and that's how they get the, the circulation. It makes for a much larger extraction. You get more tan and you get more color and you get more, more umph. And we, I'm really looking to make more elegant, more lighter uh, wines that are for the table. I want these wines to be drunk with food as well with family and friends, of course, but big, heavy, dark, heavily extracted wines, especially if they have residual sugar or if they have too much alcohol in them, are no, no friend of the table. They don't, they don't, they don't complement food. And this Syrah is just the, I mean, it's just the classic complement of food wine because especially if you grill, because you notice there's almost some burnt uh, charcoal-y almost aromas in this wine as well. So it goes great with any kind of uh, uh, charred, charred grilled meat, uh, grilled, it goes great with duck. Uh, anything with anything that's not too fatty, uh, you know, then you need something maybe a little bit more, more strong, but like low fat meats. And then this goes great with fatty fish. I love this wine with uh, tuna and, and salmon, especially salmon that's on the, on the grill. 
Um, so let's smell it. Mm. Yeah, Syrah's a big boy. It's got lots of flavor and uh, really, um, really is demanding to eat something. And that's what that's, uh, I'll do these dinners and I'll, I'll, I'll see the, the woman in the front row as I'm talking about the wine and she's going, then I'm like, don't worry. When you take a bite of your, your braised short rib, everything's going to be okay. And so she takes a bite of the braised short rib and she tastes the wine. She goes, this is the best wine I've ever had. And like, yeah, that's because we're not making them to sit there and drink at a Zoom tasting. We're making them to have at the table with food. And that's where they really, really shine, shine their best. I come from a food background. I, I had a restaurant here in Santa Barbara for many years. So I only am thinking of wine in the, in the food context. Uh, what do we have there, Sherry? I had a question kind of early on on this one. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference between Syrah and Syrahs? Yes, so we here in America call it Syrah. It's the name of the grape. And those mm -hmm. Australian blokes call it Syrahs. Syrahs. <laughs> uh, and, you know, they kind of, uh, Syrah is a, is a very popular grape in California and in the world uh, for that matter. The Australians went after it in a big way. Uh, but they made these wines that were very, very uh, jammy and sweet, and and they just uh, inundated America with them. And and then Americans started thinking that they didn't like Syrah. So we now say we don't make Syrah. We we make cold climate Syrah uh, because uh, these this wine, of course, is very lean. It's very dry. Uh, it definitely demands food. It would do great with bottle age. And so this is a completely, completely different departure than the Syrahs that the Aussies are making or some of the Syrah that's grown in warmer climate. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, this, this, is my, this is my passion. I, I, that's why I started out making, I make, made Syrah from day one. I got a, a couple of questions I'm gonna combine here. Um, Amona wanna know about, is this co-fermented? And then we also have a question about the big difference was this between 2018 and 2019 vintages. Okay, um, we do a lot of co-fermenting. Uh, uh, three of the clones of this uh, of this Syrah are planted on our estate vineyard. Uh, just to bring in one more subject, we uh, we did uh, own rooted planting in our estate vineyard. Ninety nine point nine percent of the vines in the world are planted on American rootstock, and then they have vinifera or other varietals grafted onto them. There was a little root louse in the late 1800s that destroyed the vineyards of the world uh, because the root louse came from America and it destroyed all the root, all the vines that Europeans had brought to America because the European rootstock was not uh, uh, able, not resistant to this American root louse. And then, of course, Europeans took American vines over to Europe as they're bound to do, and then the root louse just went crazy and destroyed most of the vineyards of Europe. So now the only way to solve that problem was to plant American rootstock and put European vinifera on top of it. So this is a vinifera, Syrah's a vinifera grape, but Phylloxera hasn't been in Santa Barbara County. And we have a vineyard that's very much on a steep hillside. There's only one way in, one way out. And so we are taking a huge chance by not putting the vine on American rootstock and sticking it straight into the ground. Uh, but it's been a game changer. The quality of the wines have been just off the, off the charts. Additionally, we co-planted and co-fermented 5% Viognier within the Syrah vineyard. And so that's, so that's called, that's called Masal, which is co-planting. And then we also co-ferment, but also uh, for a lot of the wines, not necessarily the M5 white, but we make another one called M5 red. So we pick Grenache and Mourvedre, two different red grapes of the same day. We'll co-ferment those because it makes a better wine. And so we do a lot of co-fermenting. Anytime we can co-ferment, our top wine, our most allocated wine, our, our most expensive wine is a wine called Uber Syrah, which is a co-fermentation of every single vineyard of Syrah and clone that we work with, which is about 12. And it co-ferments over a period of about 45 days. So if you just keep putting wood in the fire, it keeps burning. If you start a fermentation, you keep adding grapes to it, it keeps fermenting. And so that's the, that's the uh, uber fermentation. It makes an extraordinarily uh, resolved and wonderful rich dark wine. Uh, so co-fermentation is a yay. We try and do it as much as possible. Did I answer the question, Sherry? Yes, and then how about the difference between the 18 and 19? 
Oh, okay. Well, 18 was a really good vintage. Uh, uh, I don't, oh yeah, so yeah. So this was actually one of the first vintages off the, off the estate uh, for, the, for the Syrah. It was a, it was a normal vintage. We, we finally returned back to normal. We've been having these very big fluctuations in when we start harvest and when we don't, almost up to a month. Uh, so uh, we, the years prior to 18, we've been starting the harvest in early August which is sort of unheard of, and that's full on summer. We like to pick grapes in the fall, especially the, the, the brown, brown varietals. In 18, we had a return to uh, starting harvest at the beginning of September, and then we were able to pick these grapes in October. Uh, so it was a, just a good, normal harvest, very good quality, um, uh, no, no, no drama whatsoever. In 19, if you lived in Santa Barbara, or even in California as, as a whole, there was no summer. And we had a, one of the coldest uh, uh, harvests we've ever had. So the 19 wines are, are much more acidic. They're much more for aging. And we were picking grapes into November at that point because it was, uh, they took so long to ripen. Now, hang time, the amount of time the, the, the grape hangs on the vine without ripening or ripening slowly is very, very important. It increases complexities. It increases... Uh, the, the flavors of the grapes, the flavor profiles of the grapes. So 19 is just one of those extraordinary vintages we've ever had. And then we just have come off 20, with the, which is my 20th harvest, which was super hot again. It, it was a normal start, but we had these big heat spells. And so the grapes got, came in pretty ripe. And it's, it was funny because I was tasting today with my a buyer from Southern California and I was showing him the 20 wines. He's like, oh, these are delicious. These are the best you've ever made. And I wanted to tell him like, no, the 19s are the best I've ever made. But he didn't like the 19s as well as I did because they were leaner, they were tighter. They'll age better in, in all technical wine geek terms, it's better wine, but the 20s are just stupidly delicious. And uh, uh, you know, my whole staff's like, these are the best ever. And, um, but so 20 was a, was a hot, hot vintage. I, so I, I answered three vintages instead of just one. Um, we had a couple of questions just asking about how you got started in the winemaking industry, like um, coming out of school. Can you tell us a little bit about your story that, that brought yeah, you so here? I'm a, I'm a gaucho. Uh, I lived in, I grew up in Woodland Hills, California. Uh, I was a mistake child. So I was alone in a home, a big home with my parents because the other children had left to go to college. Uh, my parents, uh, my senior year of high school brought in a French exchange student and I promptly fell in love with her uh, and then uh, spent a lot of time in France in the summers that I was in going to college, spending time with her. But circle that back to the family vacation uh, when I was 14 years old and we got there, my parents rented, rented a Vanagon, a Volkswagen van uh, and, and my, of course, my brothers and sister being smart left immediately because they didn't want to be crammed into this van again with uh, my parents and their little brother. So I was miserable. Uh, but they, the first place we went was a little wine region called Chateauneuf de Pop. And the, uh, the, I went down into this deep cellar and the, the, vineyard, uh, the, the vigneron gave me a, a Tastava, which is a, a, a little silver goblet that you used to taste wine out of. And then we went into the cave and he was pulling wines out with the pipette and putting it into the, the, the Tastavan and we were tasting and he was explaining the wines and you're in this dark cellar. I never really had alcohol before. Suddenly I loved my parents. Uh, it, was, it was just all, all so good. So I started collecting Chateauneuf de Pop when I was 15 because when we got back from France, I had turned 15. And, uh, and so I had a little, little rack of Chateauneuf de Pop in my room. So I was kind of into wine, but then when I was going to France in the summer with this older French woman uh, who was fabulous, uh, we would go to wineries. I mean, I was 18 and we were, we'd, we'd go to wineries and we'd picnic and, and we just had a great time. I had no idea how, what a, what a, what a blessed thing it was at the time. But uh, I was always the guys then when I was working in restaurants or cooking in restaurants that knew more about wine than everybody else, uh, just because of this, these experiences I'd had. So I started learning more about wine and tasting wine and getting more into it. And then when I graduated from college with a BA in economics, sorry, UCSB, but that degree is worth nothing. Uh, I, I started a little tiny uh, cafe in, in Santa Barbara that was right next door to an existing wine shop. And, uh, and then you know, we had a really great, great run. Uh, and, and then uh, started, started making wine. Some friends of mine sold the restaurant and 
now devoted full time to just making making wine. Uh, that's a my, the full bio is online if you really care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> any any particular memories about your time at UCSB or in, in Isla Vista? That, yeah, that you know, you are? Uh, I'm in a very aromatic uh, life, uh, and I, I love the smells of Santa Barbara. And obviously, you know, it, all for all of us when we go back on the campus and get that combination of of uh, oil and eucalyptus, uh, it just really brings it home. Uh, no, I had a wonderful, wonderful time at UCSB and and uh, surfed a lot and, and uh, uh, just just great. I, I, I wish I'd taken longer to do it. I did it in four years. I should have done it in five and I, I, I should have taken longer. It was a great experience. Excellent. Well, looks like we got to just about all the questions. We'll wrap up with one more little one on our, our Syrah. Um, does this wine have good legs? Talk to us about the legs of this wine. <laughs> yes, it does. So when you swirl the wine uh, and, it, and it comes down on the, on, the, on the side of the glass, it separates into uh, little channels. And it's an indicator of a wine's uh, viscosity and its glycerin content. Now, obviously, if it has sugar in it, those legs are very thick. My wines, none of my wines have residual sugar in them. A lot of American wines do. They're very, it's very popular now to uh, put alcohol and sugar back in, uh, uh, back in wine, like Miomi Pinot Noir or Rombauer Chardonnay. If any of those are your favorites, they have a lot of sugar in them. Uh, but these wines are all completely dry, but you can see the legs are actually pretty thick. The straw is not shy about its alcohol. Uh, I can't read it because I don't have the right glasses on, but um, uh, I think it's, I actually have a little sheet here. Uh, it's 14.7. So yeah, the legs are, legs are, are pretty, pretty broad in, on the wine. Um, so that's what the, what the legs show. They show, you know, the, the, the viscosity of the wine, but the, the, the ones that trick you are, if it has sweetness or it has a lot of alcohol, the legs just get thicker and thicker. Wonderful. Um, we have one more question. Um, they were looking for a little bit more tasting notes on the M5 and the Syrah. Um, okay. Um, well, I have uh, what we have also, which are terrific, and we have a we have a very good website, which I printed them out because they're detailed notes about the wine, all the different vineyards, and uh, everything how it was made, the vintage conditions, how we matured them, how much we made, the alcohol, the pH, the TA, all the little all the little numbers that you shouldn't care about, but 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 once you learn some of these numbers like PA, pH and TA, TA they really help you pick out wine. So pH and, and total acidity are kind of opposite. So a high pH wine will have low acid and a low pH wine will have high acid. Generally, most red wines are you know, 3.5 to 3.6 uh, pH for us. Uh, and most of our white wines are between three and 3.2 pH. So they're much higher acid. Uh, we tend to make fairly relatively high acid wines because we they age better. They don't need as much sulfur because their the pH is low, so they're more stable. And uh, and we, uh, we we really are looking again for ways to make the wines age and be at the table and and be open without spoiling. Um, the color on the M5 white. I just think is, is has so many different hues. I really didn't discuss the color of it at all. It's got this sort of almost golden straw and a slight little hint of green uh, because especially the, the, the colors of those grapes, uh, Roussan, uh, when you pick Roussan, it's almost, almost brown. And then Viognier is, is, is very, very golden. And then Picpoul is green because it's got, it's very acidic grape. So we, we blend those three colors together You'll, that's why the, the, the colors in the uh, in the in the Marjoram M5 white are so 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 interesting because there's three there's five different grapes and they're all bringing a different uh, different set of colors. Uh, to me, the aroma in the M5 white uh, it's it's got a lot of apricot. It has that sort of sort of almost slight little bit of honey. Uh, I, I that vanilla I was talking about also could be translated to like brioche or brioche toast, which I really really love. Um, and then it always has that those some little bit of hint of tropical fruits like pineapple and mango and 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 like that. Um, the wine is very full. It's got good acidity, uh, and it's uh, uh, you know just it got a really. It also has that savory element and a really long persistent finish. So that would be the the the, the full Monty on the uh, yeah <laughs> on the white. And then on the Syrah, you know, it's very the, the color is very dark. It's almost opaque. 
Um, it, you, you, when you, when you, the best way to look at the color is to tilt it a little bit like this, and you can see it through its thickest part and through its thinnest part. Especially as wines age, you'll start to get a brown edge around them, and the color will separate. It won't be all the way out to the edge. So this wine is now two years in bottle, um, so it's separating a little bit. There's almost a clear edge, and then there's a little tiny, almost pink part of it, and then it gets more dark and opaque towards the middle. But this really gives you a big hint about the wine, whether it's going to be, you know, how it's going to taste even before you taste it and how old it is by looking at the wine through, uh, through the different, it's called the robe, looking at the robe because it has the different, all these different colors. Um, very red fruits, lots of, um, uh, I think, yeah, I think I said a lot of adjectives when I was tasting it initially, it's got a lot of licorice, it's got a lot of um, red, red licorice, it's got a lot of, oh my God, the, the Avery's have a cute dog too. <laughs> um, and it does have wood in it. It has wood aromas. And so we do age this wine in, in barrels. So it gets, gets some of that French oak smells to it. In the mouth, you know, it's got a lot of dried cranberries. It's very concentrated. Um, it just, you know, it makes you, makes you want to eat something. And that's the most important thing. Of course, then all you do all these tasty notes, and then you eat something and it tastes completely different because you put fat and flavor in your mouth that are complemented by the wine. And so then that's when it really shines because I, I love talking about wines like this, but I really love talking about the wines and how they go with food. Well, Doug, this was just a wonderful, you know, overall, I can't tell you how much love just poured into the, the, the chat room saying thank you so much, you know, oh, best you, tasting Bruce. they've ever seen and great notes. And thank you so much from, from our team. You know, alumni graduated uh, 81, Doug Mardrum, yeah, you really were something special for us today. Barbara, we have a fantastic tasting room right downtown Santa Barbara in, at the Hotel California in a block from the beach. And it is just absolutely lovely. It's, there's no tasting room like it in Santa Barbara. We have a full kitchen. Uh, we, we serve all these wines and a lot of the little tiny production wines we make. So you can taste a lot of different things. And then we will be reopening the winery June 1st. Uh, the winery is only available by appointment only, uh, but you can contact us through the website or uh, just uh, or send us an email. And uh, so we'll start taking appointments at the winery uh, after, after June 1st. Wonderful. Well, I think you're going to see all these gauchos flooding out to see you. This has been really incredible. So thank you for all of our participants. Thank you, Doug. And I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. And, you know, all gaucho reunion. What a great success this year. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. It was really fun. Thank you.